Ah, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to what is the last in a packed program of events for Women at Imperial Week uh, 2021. And one of the events that I have been particularly uh, looking forward to. Uh, it isn't quite the last event of the whole season because next week there is still the Joan, the Joan Woodward Lecture uh, in the Business School. And if you go to the uh, website, then you can see details of that uh, and, and sign up for it. Uh, but uh, today we are talking about COVID-19 and I think it can safely be said, although it's a slightly awkward and uncomfortable phrase, that Imperial has had a good pandemic. Uh, awkward un and uncomfortable because obviously it's had extremely serious and sad repercussions for many, uh, many people. Uh, but Imperial has made major contributions across the board and of course many different people, both women and men, uh, from all sorts of backgrounds um, have been playing their part in that. Uh, but today we're focusing on the particular contributions of uh, women at Imperial and women researchers. And we have three experts of truly international uh, renown to tell us about their work and uh, reflect upon their careers um, at Imperial. So we have uh, Professor Wendy Barclay, Professor Helen Ward uh, and Professor Azra Ghani. And I'm very grateful to all of them for agreeing to give up time in their busy schedules to be with us um, today. So I'm really looking forward to it because uh, virology is my own research background and there's really actually uh, not nearly enough virology in my day to day life right now. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me hand you over uh, to our chair, uh, Dr. Red Elmadi. Super great. Hello all. Welcome again. Thanks very much for that. Um, Lovely introduction, Stephen. So welcome to this Women at Imperial event organised by the EDI, um, looking at the women at Imperial who have been tackling COVID-19. Um, my name is Red Almadi. I'm a medical doctor and postdoc currently working in epidemiology in Copenhagen, Denmark, but I'm here um, virtually. That's one of, been one of the wonderful things about the pandemic, I suppose. We can have more of these events together. Um, so I was actually last back in the UK during the first wave um, of the uh, COVID pandemic. It was this time last year that I travelled back just shortly after, and it was exactly a year ago almost to the day that the WHO announced um, that the uh, what was previously an epidemic became an international pandemic and it was made official. And today we have three of Imperial's finest, women in parenthesis of course they are all excellent researchers um, and as has Stephen has said um, of international renown and foremost in their fields to discuss with us this first year of the pandemic. We'll be taking questions throughout the session so please post your questions in the chat and if there's any question that's already been posted just to save us time uh, instead of reiterating it, repeating it, rephrasing it, just give it a like and that will make sure um, that it's, it goes up the, up the list to be put to the panel. So keep those coming in throughout. I will now hand over to each of our wonderful panellists to give a short introduction of who they are and their work and where they were a year ago, perhaps, um, that might be useful to share with us. So we'll start with Azra Gahini and then we'll go to Helen. Um, Ward and then Wendy Barclay. OK, thanks, Red, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Azra Ghani. I'm a professor in infectious disease epidemiology in um, the MRC Centre in the School of Public Health. Um, I've had actually quite a long association uh, with Imperial. I did actually do an undergraduate degree initially, not at Imperial, in mathematics, um, but my first transition into epidemiology was actually when I joined what was actually St Mary's Hospital at the time um, to start a, a PhD in epidemiology and actually my first um, employer was Helen Ward who's sitting here on the panel so um, I worked at that time on contact tracing which is of course very relevant to many of the um, studies we're having um, 
today around COVID, and that was all to do with sexually transmitted diseases. Um, since then, I've actually left Imperial twice, but came back in 2007 um, as a full professor. So I've had a varied sort of um, understanding uh, career in, di in different places, but really focusing on mathematical modelling and infectious disease epidemiology. Um, before 2007, I was involved in quite a lot of outbreaks work um, that started with uh, BSE and variant CJD um, back in the late 1990s. Um, I worked uh, together with many other colleagues who are here at Imperial today on the 2003 SARS outbreak in Hong Kong um, and also on the H1N1 2009 flu. Um, since 2007, though, my main focus has been on malaria. And up until um, the end of 2019, I was really focusing entirely on malaria. And that's, of course, focused in low middle income countries. So that all changed, of course, with the emergence of the new SARS coronavirus. And actually, as a group, we've been working on it since January. And I joined um, that effort in the middle of January 2020. So that's over a year now. It's been a very intense experience, um, ups and downs all the way through. All of our work is really trying to get a grasp on what's happening, how the science informs the spread of the virus and what the potential impact can be of different control measures. Uh, it's much of my work has been with the global health partners rather than the UK focus. Um, so working with institutions like WHO and more recently places like Gavi in terms of vaccine introductions. Um, so a year ago today, interestingly enough, I started drafting the text for Report 9, which has almost become infamous as the first one of the big reports that we put out. I think it was on the 16th or 17th of March last year. Um, and that, although we've been working on that for a good two months in terms of the inputs into it, I think on reflection, the most interesting thing was how much of a shock it was when we did the media presentation in the Science Media Centre to journalists. I can just remember their faces dropping in shock when we told them real the reality of what we felt this pandemic meant, that there would need to be major restrictions in place. And perhaps most shockingly of all, that we had no solution to this. We didn't know what the answer was. Um, and I think that's something that's been characterizing the pandemic uh, throughout, that we are all learning. We don't have a complete understanding and we're trying to make decisions or informed decisions, I should say, we don't make the decisions, but informed decisions based on the best evidence that we have at that point in time. OK. OK, um, so thanks to that and thanks for the introduction um, from Red. It is it does make me feel a little bit old that Azra has <laughs> started working for me, left Imperial twice, came back and that Red also was a PhD student and a BSc student under my care. So I seem as if I've been around forever. Well, I have been around forever. Um, anyway, thanks for the opportunity to um, to say something here. So my background is I'm a professor of public health. I'm a clinician by background working on HIV and sexual health, then moved into sort of public health research. Um, and my focus as a researcher over the decades um, was on improving, was finding out, using epidemiological methods to find out about risks and the variation in risks, but focusing particularly on interventions and improving sexual health and addressing inequalities. That's the, the key thing that has sort of brought all my work together, if you like. Um, and most recently, over the last 10 years, I've linked that into work on what's broadly called involvement around health research. So public involvement, patient involvement, ensuring that patient experiences um, is as good as can be and that patients are able to help inform the kind of research that is, is done and really supports their well-being. Um, another large part of my work which I should mention is around public health education. So I've been Director of Education in the School of Public Health at Imperial for um, many years now. So what's been happening? So I felt almost like my, you know, the three decades of um, my research, my education and my work had almost been preparing me for what happened um, in early 2020. Um, and therefore it was absolutely inevitable that I would get um, involved in the response. And the first thing that I did actually was in, in gen 
like Azra, started work on this in, in January, and it was to develop an online course, which um, we did with Coursera or through Coursera, a public free online course around, it was called Science Matters, let's talk about COVID-19. And the reason for that was I felt that there was a lot of misinformation. People didn't understand the science, they didn't understand modelling, they didn't understand the virology. So we developed something quite quickly and it, it evolved over a couple of months. And already by the, um, you know, by the end of February, we'd had 7,000 people enrolled on that course. It's now 140,000 or something people. Um, but uh, my module that I put in that was on the importance of community engagement. And that has been something that I have been really, really keen to stress throughout this pandemic, because if you don't bring the communities and community and communities with you, then you're not going to be able to respond to something like this, which requires a lot of people to change a lot of things about the way they live and the way they work. So a year ago, um, exactly, was the last day I think that I was in the office um, and we kind of closed our research group office and decided to work from home with the expectation that we might be back in a few weeks. <laughs> um, and most, most of us, apart from going in for occasional uh, meetings or responsibilities, have not been back since. I would just, to sort of summarise what I have been involved in, is apart from the education, um, which I have continued to do. In March, I would say that I did public health lobbying. I think there's a lot of public health people who hadn't done any research on this, it was a new conditions, but we had a pretty good idea. And we looked at the models, the kind of thing that Azra's described, and we knew that this needed to have serious um, response. So raising awareness, tr but trying to point out and anticipate some of the problems that we'd seen from other epidemics, things like Ebola, things like HIV, trying to anticipate where the stigma was going to damage response. I got very annoyed in early March about the fact that every time they were talking in any country about deaths, it was all about, well, deaths in old people or those with underlying conditions, as if this was a, something that therefore didn't quite matter as much. Um, and I was very keen that we should actually understand the social context in which both we talk about it, but also what might affect people's ability to um, respond. Um, so I was blogging, I was writing letters to the Times, things like that, urging more stringent interventions. And in, on the 13th of March, we launched a, my team, we launched a community engagement exercise to find out what people wanted in terms of research priorities and response. And we carried out, we commissioned um, a poll, a, um, an opinion poll type thing, um, a survey um, which we published on the 20th of March. That was my first publication on this, which showed a really high level of willingness of people to take preventive interventions and to stay at home and self-isolate um, if they needed to. But there was a real social gradient with the people who had the least money, who had the lowest levels of education, who had multiple jobs, um, and so on, were least able. They said they were willing to do things, but they couldn't see that they would be able to do things like self-isolate. And so that led to, you know, me and many others calling for, if we're having, lock we need lockdown, but we need wage protection. And in a way, that's kind of followed me through in terms of trying to get people to understand the inequalities in the way this um, pandemic is affecting people, not just in this country, but internationally. But also that that has to be taken into account if you're going to have a response that is effective. And then April was when I got the opportunity to work with colleagues to design the REACT study, which is what I have been doing when well, it feels like 24 hours a day ever since, um, which is a study of community prevalence, large study of swabs for the virus and um, antibody tests in a random sample. And we've now had over 2 million people participating in those studies. So I've been quite busy, but it's been an amazing experience. I have learnt more than I've ever learnt in a year, I think. It's been um, really quite an outstanding and enjoyable, but frustrating and exhausting year. So thanks for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the discussion. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, my name is Wendy Barclay. I'm a professor of virology 
um, currently the head of the Department of Infectious Disease here at Imperial. Um, I'm what you call a molecular virologist, so I work with the virus itself and understand how it works. Um, I've been working on viruses for 30 odd years and that all started when I did a PhD at a place called the Common Cold Unit, uh, which was a fascinating volunteer centre on Salisbury Plain where people came for a holiday uh, and uh, they got a cold stuck up their nose, a rhinovirus back in the day, which caused the vast majority of seasonal common colds and we studied them and I was studying the immune response, the antibodies, uh, measuring antibodies and trying to work out if they um, so the interesting thing about that is that nearly 30 years later, I'm still doing the same thing with Helen in React 2. Um, after looking at rhinoviruses, uh, I um, moved on and sort of did, did some more molecular work. I had the opportunity to do a postdoctoral uh, training abroad in New York at the Mount Sinai Medical Center, and there I worked on influenza. And then really for the vast majority of the rest of my career, I've studied influenza, in particular, trying to understand pandemics and why we occasionally have a virus that emerges from an animal source and mutates or in a way that enables it to become a human pathogen. Um, and for that reason, I was very much um, involved in various uh, organisations and, and thinking around pandemics and pandemic preparedness strategies and found myself, uh, you know, a good five years or so uh, being invited to sit on a on a government board, a uh, Department of Health and Social Care board called NERVTAG, uh, which is, is a board that nobody had ever heard of, I think, until about a year ago. And now lots of people seem to know what NERVTAG is or think they know what NERVTAG is. But it's it's a group of people who advise um, government about new and emerging respiratory virus threats. Um, so I was there because I knew about flu and then of course about a year ago uh, all of us had to switch and start thinking about a different class of viruses, coronaviruses and just as Helen has, has said I think in the past year I have learned more than I have probably in 30 years of my molecular virology career. I think for all of us, it's an incredible onslaught of information that needs to be very rapidly processed and digested and then passed on to other people and shared as appropriate. Um, so nowadays I find myself sitting on several of such committees uh, and giving advice, but in hopefully a, a way that enables other people to take the science that I'm capable of digesting and, and act upon it. Um, I think one of the things which is a, a delight, uh, it, if one can say, is that I have got to work with people like Azra and Helen more than I ever did before. And I think that we've all learned a huge amount by working together. Uh, and there is, I think, a real willingness in the scientific community to pool together on this. Um, so, for example, I'm currently leading a group called G2P, a genotype to phenotype. That means how do we understand all the genomic var variation in, in the virus and how do we interpret that and, and know what to expect in terms of the way that affects the, the phenotype, the way the, the virus behaves. And that is a collaboration of, of 22 investigators across 10 UK institutions all working together. Um, these people have not all worked on respiratory viruses before, but all molecular virologists like me. And rather than trying to do our own thing independently, uh, we decided to come together and, and work uh, in a sort of cohesive, high throughput, increased capacity way uh, so that we can um, assess, for example, the variants as they arise and get information out faster to policymakers who have to make difficult decisions based on, on very scant science. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, been a whirlwind. I think we're all exhausted. Uh, but I think it's not over yet um, and uh, maybe some of those sentiments will come out <laughs> as we continue on to discuss later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, I actually, as we're talking about that report, I, I actually remember 
um, finding it and reading it, and it must have been a year ago now, and, and sharing. I, I was, you know, it really couldn't believe it. I was quite shocked and sharing the findings of my family and my brother-in-law. And he was like, well, is it really, you know, could it possibly be this bad as that? Um, and I think we we have all learned and that early work really did help us sort of realise what it could possibly be. And um, so I do remember that a year ago as well. Um, and Helen, you've not been around for ages. <laughs> you've just been a, a, obviously a very substantial part of, of uh, the kind of work that we all, we all love to do. So and, and a great champion for us. So thanks. Um, what I will put to you all, and maybe Wendy, you, you could start uh, with this question is, is perhaps answering in the last year, what has been the most substantial change in your field or the thing that's made you um, really uh, consider you've had, a, that's been a huge improvement or that the pandemic's just changed and shifted in your work? Um, I imagine all of your respective fields have changed in lots of ways, but what do you think has been the most significant for the research you do? So I think, I think one of the things which is important to recognise is the huge change in, in the way that the science is communicated. So until last year, I had never posted anything on bio archives um, or actually released anything that wasn't peer reviewed. Um, but nowadays, I uh, I learn more from Twitter and bio archives than I do from reading nature. Um, not to say that I don't still read nature, um, the, the articles are important, they're peer reviewed, uh, but the information flow has completely transformed. And it may be that that was already the case in other fields, but from a, my point of view, from this virology field, uh, this, is, this is revolutionized, I think, the way that we pass on the information that we have. And I think it's partly goes back to that sentiment I was referring to that people are really, I mean, obviously we're all so affected and so struck by, by the immensity of this, that there is a sort of collegiality, a wishing to, to act together and work together and, that, and a, a knowledge that, uh, it's an acceptance that knowledge is so important for that. So as soon as there's information to share, just get it out there. Um, and, you know, postings, multiple postings a day. As I say, every night now I go to bed and look at my Twitter feed before I go to bed and see the people I'm following, you know, because I, I find out information um, there which would have taken me months to find out had it gone through some sort of peer reviewed process and then finally come out um, in either a printed version or even an online version. So for me, it's the whole way that this science is being done, which is the most profound. There isn't one single discovery that I mean, there are multiple, multiple scientific leaps and bounds, which I think you know, we will look back on and see that the vaccines will be the largest. But there are so many other discoveries that will come out through this intense period of research. But the speed with which they come out and which we share that knowledge is absolutely revolutionary. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that. De democratization almost of the science and knowledge has just meant that there's been a rapid escalation um, of the work that can actually be achieved so that's I've noticed that as well it's been really really phenomenal um, and Helen have you what's what's changed I mean you've mentioned quite a lot of things but what do you think has been the most substantial? I think I mean, personally, I, I agree with Wendy that the, the way information, it's not just the science, it's also the information about numbers of cases and all those kind of things where you can check daily to see what's happening everywhere. I think that transparency of the best data that people have, I think has. But the main thing I'd say personally from my experience of doing research has been this, the most extraordinary collaborative approach and the, the the fact that that has been across not just across disciplines but even within within disciplines like in public health so I now work you know very closely with people who I have uh, who are you know chronic disease epidemiologists <laughs> who I'd never worked very closely with before but we're kind of all working together in these collaborations and that bringing together those different skill sets so across ep epidemiology and 
as I say, chronic um, different disease, infectious disease epidemiology, modeling, statistics, data science, virology, clinical virology, work and also diagnostics. All of those things coming together in a really intimate, you know, almost daily working relationship. That's been what's changed for me. It's not that, OK, once a month or once a term, you'll have a meeting where you'll have a chat. No, this certainly early on, this was every single day. What have we got to do? What have we not done from yesterday's list, etc. And added to that, which again resonates with what Wendy um, mentioned is doing that alongside people who are project managers, but also communications people. I think all of that coming together has been has made it so um, exciting. Um, and also, I think it has meant that we have achieved more than we would have done in the sort of more siloed ways of working. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that definitely speaks to me as well. I think it's changed also our personal um, interactions with one another in the obvious way, because now we're far more virtual. But I certainly remember going back to the wards and working on the COVID wards, and it was a bit like um, a kind of dis deconstruction of the of the traditional um, silos and hierarchies, even in clinical work. I mean, I was working with a consultant dermatologist and psychiatrist um, who who were essentially, again, um, working as junior doctors. So it was, it was a really interesting change in how we interact with one another and how we value each other's knowledge and abilities and skills. So I think that's I can definitely um, that that resonates with me, Helen. Um, and Azra, you can you've had a, a bit more of an international take on a lot of these things. So what would you say? No, ab absolutely. Actually, I was, I was exactly where I was going to, to go. Um, I agree with Wendy's point and Helen's point that, that has changed our way of working. Um, and I think the way this has really benefited um, our engagement with global partners has been great, fantastic, because one of the biggest barriers to improving science in the lower middle income countries has been just the availability of money, not being able to turn up at meetings, um, to be engaged in the scientific debate. And this whole switch to an online way of working, although, of course, it's got many downsides. It has meant we can engage in a much more equal, what feels much more like an equal partnership um, with many of, of our country partners. So we've we've been working, uh, you know, just it, with teams in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, um, in exactly the same way as we're working with people who used to sit in the office next door to us. And I think that's been fantastic. We're getting much more engagement and much more sort of information flow at a, at a much more rapid level. Uh, that's been really, really fun to do. I, I can see that staying. Um, so mm -hmm. some things, for example, like, you know, the online conferences, well, we miss the social interactions, we all do, and we would like to have a bit more of that, but it does mean it's accessible. Um, another example I can give, I sit on a WHO committee, it used to happen in Geneva three times a year, and only, the only people who would attend were those who could afford to fly to Geneva. That's now gone online, um, that's on malaria, so all the people living sitting in endemic areas can can attend that meeting and that's been hugely beneficial um, to get the inputs as well from a much more diverse, diverse audience so i think we'll come out of this in a really good way mm. and there'll, there'll be many other uh, benefits of, of how we've learned to work i have to say my one pet hate is we do maths and it's really hard to do that on the screen we've been scrolling things down on pieces of paper and trying to put them up at the camera it just doesn't work so we a little bit of that face-to-face -face interaction would be great to have again. Yeah, where well, you need someone to develop some very nifty math software to help us be able to do that sort of thing virtually. So we have a question. Um, we have two actually, and I think one, um, one we can perhaps uh, address because it relates to what you've been saying, both Wendy and Helen, about um, where we get our scientific information from and that peer review process. And it's from Stephen Curry who asks, are there risks, um, especially for work in public health, um, in this change in scholarly communication? Um, which is, uh, I don't know, Wendy's nodding away. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think that one of the downsides, uh, one of the things we need to be cautious about going forwards is the, the, the lack of peer review. 
if you like, um, of, think, of information that can be posted. Um, it's great to have this rapid speed and to share, uh, but there is currently, I think, a lack of standardization um, about it. And I'm not really sure. I, I, don't, I don't want to restrict the information in any sense whatsoever because I think the sharing is so powerfully important. Um, but I do worry, as with all, you know, all social media, with all new ways of communication, there, there is an opportunity there for voices to, to, that are less informed to be, to be taken in a way that is perhaps could be dangerous. So I'm, yeah, I don't have a solution for it, but I think we have to think about that going forwards and, and be cautious somehow. I, yeah, I would agree with that, but I think, yeah, the change is going to be permanent and I think we have to find ways of, um, of working with that. And I think one of the other good things that should come out of this is to change the way that academic publishing works, which is completely dysfunctional to everybody except some of the big publishing houses. Um, so I think if it can achieve that by us seeing that whether it's by post publication review, um, which is open and transparent. I mean, there, we all like to think that, oh, if it's peer reviewed, it's true. But we know that's not true either, that a lot of um, not very correct things get through peer review, just as a lot of you know correct things get ditched. So I think it, this should open up the possibility. It's certainly a kind of mass experiment on what um, what happens when you open that particular door and let people do it. I think there are challenges to come back to Stephen's point about it's not just the non peer reviewed. I think it is the um, people getting very vocal in support of a position. And that's been one of the things that's really depressed me about this pandemic is that a lot of academics in public health and elsewhere have appeared to take sort of taking sides in the sense of, you know, pinning your colours to a particular mass. You're either anti this or pro this, which is completely not how science should work. And people seem to be unwilling to say there is a lot we don't know and therefore we need to be open to we might take a provisional position because you've got to do something, but you have to be open to that position being wrong, whether it's on masks, whether it's on hand washing, on you know airborne transmission, whatever it happens to be. Don't just say I'm right and therefore everybody else is being horrible. It's you know, we, we can't work like that. And I think I've seen far too much of that, especially on Twitter. Um, but that's my view on that. Just yeah, just I mean, just to add on that point, I think we've all found it really difficult to cope with the level of communication that we've suddenly been thrown into the limelight. Um, we're not necessarily trained for that. We're, we're trained to be scientists. We like to just sit in our offices or labs in, in Wendy's ca case and, and do the research. Um, and those papers that are not peer reviewed or even if they are peer reviewed are appearing on the front pages of the newspapers every morning. And there's this constant communication of, of results. I, I can only imagine for a non-specialist how confusing this must all be um, because it's pretty hard when you're a specialist in this area to keep up with it and to go back to find the right preprint to say is this actually correct or not um, and that 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 constantness of the of the, it being in the news is also quite tiring I think for, for everybody of course but it's quite tiring when you're working on it um, to, to feel like you've got that added component of your work about communicating and making sure that everything you say is based on, you know, is of course based on the best evidence you have at the moment, but then also defending things you said in the past, which were based on different pieces of information. And we're finding that particularly with the modelling, it's very confusing for people to understand why things have changed three weeks later. Well, the world is changing at such a pace that what we maybe sent to UK government three weeks ago and then has been put out in a report isn't exactly what we would do right this minute. Um, so I think that 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 is going to be challenging going forwards as well. It will continue. Yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting, and that's that uh, managing the the politics of science in this pandemic, and that's with a small p. You know, um, how we put things across, and and who we put it across to, and why. And just sort of as I've 
got you as Renau thinking along these lines and Wendy's, uh, sorry, Helen's already said that people are sort of pinning, uh, what's the phrase there, sort of views and they want to stick by them. What do you think, stepping back and considering the bigger picture of this last year, have been the big successful interventions that we weren't sure about at first? Um, and of course, we've only got the scenario of what's happened, but, but what has worked in terms of masks and social distancing and stages of lockdown, school closure, et cetera, what do you think has been successful? Yeah. I mean, I think we all theoretically, if we go back a year ago or a year and two months ago, was I think, well, we've all been talking about this word social distancing. It was something that was just in academic papers for years, right? We've been thinking about it, but not necessarily translating into what does that actually mean on your daily life? And, and I think when we go back a year and think about what we thought would happen, we didn't think the very wide scale restrictions, the lockdowns, whatever would happen in most societies. Um, we saw it happening, of course, in China. We expected that. We'd seen it before. Um, in 2003 with SARS, so that wasn't unexpected. Um, but I don't think any of us actually thought this would happen here. And there's a really odd disconnect going on that we just thought, you know, the society feels too libertarian, we wouldn't possibly um, adhere to this. So I think it was really interesting to see how the population response was really very strong, as Helen said earlier, um, to, to accepting these things. There is no doubt in my mind that if you reduce social interactions, then transmission goes down. I think that evidence is really clear. Where the politics comes in is who's telling you to, to do that. Um, and there is, of course, a big distinction between a government enforcing something and the Swedish example, which is often quoted back at us. But in fact, populations have changed their behaviour and whether it's mandated or not, it has mm. an impact. Um, so anything that is reducing contact um, face mask is a really interesting one because I think we all didn't really think. I, honestly, I went on television in February thinking, no, this wasn't a good idea. Partly because we were also very acutely aware that there was a shortage of PPE and we didn't want people suddenly trying to buy up that shortage um, in a sort of mass panic, which was already happening across the world and we could see it, certainly see it in Southeast Asia. Um, but of course, data emerged. You, you have to change and keep up to date with that. So I don't, I think it's difficult when you get held account to something you said a year ago. It comes up with the same issue, with all those discussions we were having about herd immunity. I mean, we we're having these in a theoretical way, but then they get played out as if they're one side or the other, and there was never a one side or the other. Um, but yeah, social distancing is, is, is where we've got to where we are now. And then of course, we're very much hoping vaccines will do a lot of the heavy lifting going forwards. Great, thank you. Um... Yeah, that's that's actually very useful and, and good to know. Um, so on the topic of vaccines, Wendy, um, is there are vaccines going to be the um, magic bullet in uh, this pandemic? Is it going to be the solution? And is there anything we should be worrying about in terms of the vaccine safety or efficacy um, in the next year or so? Well, I think we have to start off by saying it, it is absolutely phenomenal that we have vaccines for a new pathogen in people's arms and clearly that the clinical trials and the early real world effectiveness data show that they're keeping people out of hospital. Um, you know, there are multiple studies now here in Israel um, where vaccines have been widely used and I think the data are very convincing. Um, lots of different sorts of vaccines, but so far all looking good. Um, so I think Hazra is quite right. We, we have to keep sticking with the notion that vaccines will do the heavy lifting and, and, and help. Uh, I can't really comment so much on the safety. I think I'll leave that to one of my colleagues to, to comment about. I mean, my trust goes out to, to the trials having been done. And I think, I think Bearing in mind how many doses are now being used, I feel fairly confident. I think the key question for a molecular vi virologist like myself now is whether or not the virus will evolve in response to increasing natural or vaccine induced immunity in such a way that we will need to update vaccines. And of course, as I said earlier, I came from influenza where you know we have this evolution ongoing we have to update vaccines on an annual basis and we have a huge worldwide system in place by which we do that 
Um, there are many, many unknowns at the moment about whether or not we're going to need to update vaccines. The first is that um, we don't actually know how to measure very well uh, what, when, they're, when they're not working well enough. We, at the moment, we're simply waiting to, to look for if the vaccine effectiveness goes down in parts of the world where some of these new variants are circulating in a way that indicates the real world the vaccines aren't working very well. But that's a huge lag. If we have to wait uh, and use a vaccine and then watch it not fail not or not work very well, that's not very satisfactory. What we need in place is a forward-looking uh, correlate by which we can predict which variants we might need to worry about, which ones we have to focus on and prioritise. The other side of the coin is that these new vaccines are pretty amazing. I mean, I when WHO set its sort of parameters by which it would think a vaccine was worth using, I don't think anyone in their wildest dream would have imagined 95% uh, efficacy in a clinical trial. I mean, that was that was an unbelievable thing. Um, so by that, what I mean is that with flu, where we do update vaccines every year, we'd, we'd be very happy with a 50% efficacy. Um, we're, we're at a level with SARS where the amount of immune response that the new vaccines like the mRNA vaccines induce is so great, it might just be that if we boost and maintain that level of antibody, we might not need to update the vaccines. The, the virus may just not get out from that. It might be enough. So there are there are two sides. We have to be prepared to respond, um, but we also have to, to be open minded and say this isn't flu. This is something different and, and maybe we get out of this in a different way. So, yeah, to come back to your question, vaccines, I think, are the way out. Um, it's, it's huge admiration for the people who them out there. There is a lot of worry at the moment that variants might you know, be the be the the thing that stops this being the way out. But I, I don't want to give everybody that impression today. I think there are things we can do. We can either update the vaccine because this new technology is very um, flexible, very fast responding, and or we might not need the really fantastic vaccines in terms of their potency. Uh, thanks so much, Wendy. That's actually really good news because I think in my mind, I had always thought that this would end up becoming a bit like the flu scenario where we'd need constant updates. But even to consider that maybe that won't be the case is, is really reassuring. So possibly. <laughs> um, thanks for sharing that. So on, on this point, then we know vaccines are are a really key part of this, um, Helen, but of course, vaccines are only as good or oh, as use, useful in any case if people take them. Um, we've had a very good response in the UK, but we have had pockets of vaccine hesitancy, I think. Um, and maybe some of that speaks to people's concerns around safety. Um, which areas do you think have, have made people a little bit more concerned about getting vaccinated? Is there any specific things that you'd like to, myths you'd like to debunk, perhaps. You're on mute. Classic. Actually, as you say, particularly in the UK, where the vaccine's being rolled out quite very quickly, yeah. um, in the groups that have been invited, the uptake is pretty high, well, very high in most groups. And there's a few groups where it is lower. And when I mean, we've done work on this already and those groups, um, which we know are often groups that are at higher risk, I think it's really important to listen to what the concerns are because very few people from what we've seen in our survey and other people's research, very few people are anti-vax. And there's a danger that people who are who have concerns are being uh, branded as oh you're all anti-vaxxers and that's you know that's the you're the problem mm -hmm. and I think we have to be a lot more subtle in the way that we work with people and we listen to concerns and in the work that we did around asking people who were not sure or who were going to say no why and what issues there were there were some very legitimate concerns so at the moment 
women who are pregnant are advised not to get the vaccine unless they're particularly high risk. Now that's, the, and people who have um, allergies to any of the components are advised not to get the vaccine. People hear that and that translates into, well, I'm trying to get pregnant, so maybe I shouldn't get it. Or I might get want to get pregnant in a couple of years, so maybe I'll just, because people don't understand what that's about. So I think we have to work much harder. I think it's our problem, not the people who are unsure. I think we have a responsibility to be much better. And we've talked a lot already about communication, but we can communicate better to answer people's concerns and not dismiss them as being anti-vax or don't care or you know silly silly beliefs or conspiracy theorists that is not the case for i know, I know there are conspiracy theories and i know there are people who are and you know are very anti-vaccine but we can actually work i think to to narrow that gap and that means working with individuals because a lot of people have clinical concerns i'm on these drugs do they interact don't know no you know there's no information talk to your doctors and so on but also if it's in particular communities who are unsure there may be good reasons again working with communities engaging communities in the programs has actually shown it works so i think we just have to not be so um kind of well you're either for it or against it that's not you know, we must get out of the Brexit mentality and just actually try and work with people to say it's in everybody's interests to try and do to try and make this work. Um, and as I say, once people are actually invited, um, they seem to have quite a high uptake rate. It's it's in the um, you know the hypothetical future that people go, no, I don't think I will. But when mm -hmm. they're invited, they go, oh, well, actually, you know. I might be able to go on holiday if I get one of these. So there's lots of reasons why you might want to get one. Yeah, that's actually that's really reassuring. Actually, it's good to hear that that it's not having a huge impact on on people actually saying yes to the vaccination. And I suppose perhaps it's because it seems quite an appealing thing now. It's it's something that people are seem they see celebrities and people desperate to get hold of it. So they think, oh, it can't be perhaps that bad. Maybe I should I should just take it if it's offered. Um, but you're, you're just, completely right. Can I just add one thing, which is I think our responsibility as public health people is to gather the evidence because it is true. We don't know what happens to people who've had these vaccines after six months, a year, 10 years, whatever. You never know when because they've only been um, in trials for a, a relatively shorter period of time. So we shouldn't just didn't say they are perfect we don't know and we have to follow them up and we have to show that we are doing due diligence around that so that the post implementation surveillance of side effects and of just looking out for any possible problems whether it's the kind that wendy's been talking about where they might not work anymore or whether it's um, anybody getting or any particular groups of people getting side effects we have to make sure that we are really really looking for that and not trying to just um you know just say it's all wonderful and keep you know not hearing anything we, we do need to be alert to that and so we're setting those kind of things in place and uh, uh, we need to collaborate on that as well internationally yeah, yeah I, I just, and i just add to that um it, it is important to note that this is standard for all new vaccines so no new vaccine that is introduced has had a history of being used just by definition uh, and post-marketing surveillance has been a really critical part of allowing vaccination programs um, and I think the important thing to, to remember is that um, the higher income countries have the facility to do this and there's systems in place and I think it really is important for, for therefore for countries like the UK to lead the way in this because that will also provide the evidence that will be relevant to other populations where it's going to be much more difficult just because of the lack of the same sort of health system or surveillance system being in place to be able to, to, be, to, to monitor for any side effects. Yeah, that, that sort of post-administration surveillance. And it is completely our responsibility. It's ongoing. And I think it's important to actually communicate that message. I know we've got um, pharmacoepidemiologists in our team who are looking at, well, actually what happens when you vaccinate people who are on biological immunotherapies, um, which are key questions that we honestly haven't yet got the answer to. So, um, so it's good to highlight that all of us are still doing that work and having that open and honest 
conversation about vaccination and what it means. Mm -hmm. um, so Azra, I've got a question for you that's come up from Anonymous. <laughs> But um, it relates to what you were saying about um, resources and um, who has the resources to um, to carry out this kind of work. But it's specifically in relation to your work in malaria and our resources, do you feel being diverted in the pandemic world, the post pandemic world from other diseases and other areas? And I suppose a few of us could could speak to that. But. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I can just make a start on that. I, th I think this is a really big risk and we have certainly seen it in terms of not the research, but the um, just the public health resources that are going into COVID. Um, so, for example, in many settings, uh, low, in lower income settings, there's a fairly limited supply of oxygen that has been diverted to COVID at the expense of pneumonia in children, which is a major killer. Um, so the same resources are needed for multiple diseases. And then on top of that, you have the workforce and the ability to respond and all the impacts that the pandemic is having. I think that can become a problem in some settings. Um, so in many settings, malaria is still killing more children than COVID is demonstrably killing adults. Um, this is partly due to an issue of surveillance, but it is still a big, very big problem. And getting those priorities right when the whole world is focused on one disease is really quite challenging. Um, so I can see this also impacting in terms of the research. There is a shift in the global research agenda to global health security. Um, and I feel sometimes that that global health security is really under, underneath the hood is just saying we need to protect ourselves first mm. and not necessarily taking an equitable approach to say every life matters and we need to protect all these other lives as well. They should be equal. Um, so I think that's a definitely an issue I see on the horizon that that money will be diverted um, and maybe focusing on on threats rather than existing endemic diseases that kill, will kill many, many people. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. I mean, I know, Helen, some, so much of the work that you've done your whole life has been focused on inequities and um, I don't know if this sort of pandemic has perpetuated these already sort of existing um, systemic issues that we have both in global and health and, and public health at home? I think uh, certainly within countries, the very unequal burden of COVID is, is very transparent and it has just shone a light on health inequalities and inequalities, social inequalities basically, by just showing how much higher the risks are in people who do the essential work which is almost essential work is almost <laughs> equivalent to being low paid you know if you don't get paid much your job must be actually really important um, because we've been completely reliant on people whether it's transport workers shop workers as well as health workers of course but the particularly um, low paid people that keep society going have, have you know paid a price in terms of their vulnerability um, to this but I think more at a more there's other aspects of this that Azra has just touched on in terms of a, yes, there has been a sort of nationalist type, nationalistic approach to like the vaccine rollout. We, we're going to get all our people um, covered. And the recently announced cuts to the overseas budgets, I think are going to be you know, potentially devastating. And I think that that's where you need to stand back and say, well, that's what does undermine it, its global security. It's not just global health security. It's not just about, you know, stopping threats to high income um, people it, or high income countries from infectious disease threats. It needs to be about actually um, equity and um, distribution of resources to, to address some of these really fundamental problems that are about, they're about equity, they're, they are about security, they are about, you know, things that are driving um, uh, migration and things like that, that away from countries where, for example, healthcare workers are needed to other countries where we really should be producing more healthcare workers and not taking them from other countries. There's so many issues, as, as you well know, Red, having done your global health course with us, you can probably speak much more eloquently about them than I can. <laughs> No, I think that's a pretty good summary. I do, I do like that um, description you just gave. Uh, 
the the less you earn is probably a, a strong indicator of how important your job is. Which uh, I think it's sort of, is it David Graeber who sort of talks about that in bullshit jobs. I I think of it as the as the Graeber paradox, <laughs> which um, certainly is something that's been highlighted as extraordinarily um, clear um, in this pandemic. I'm aware of the time we have, so I'm just going to sort of move the conversation slightly and bring Wendy in to a question that we had <laughs> back to a sort of more women women's uh, uh, week conversation. And it relates to what you were saying about collaboration and what so many of us uh, actually have touched on as what's been a real fundamental shift. The question comes from Roz, who says, do you think that this cross-disciplinary collaboration is because we've got more women in scientific leadership? Um, I'd love to say yes. Um, and actually, I do think that there is an ease with which one can converse with women, which does make that collaboration easy. For, certainly for me personally, um, I, you know, there are some fantastic women. Um, I mean, Fiona Fox wrote a super article from the Science Media Centre, I thought, at, at the weekend, sort of saying that lots of women have played a big, big role in this pandemic. And I think particularly at places like Public Health England, there are some really great women who have uh, given true leadership there. And certainly my interactions with those are, are, are easy um, for, for whatever reason. It's, it's quite easy to have a chat and, and do some science and work well. And, you know, sometimes it is just a little bit more tricky with, with some men. It's very difficult not, not to generalise here. The, in the in the virology consortium that I've managed to pull together, um, I am the only female of the 10 academic institutions in, in the leading role there. Um, and I think in my area that does tend to be about the balance in, in most meetings. Um, so the fact that, uh, you know, we're managing to collaborate well, I think isn't exclusively down to the fact that there are lots of women to collaborate with. But I do think that having some women close to the top with leadership can sometimes help break down whatever barriers there may have been in the past. And, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm finding it absolutely delightful to be able to work with lots of, with everyone, but in particular with, with women uh, in this pandemic. I think it's been a really good uh, show of female strength, if you like. Mm. Don't know if either yeah. you, Azrael, yeah. Yeah, no, I would like to, um, because I think, although, yeah, we've got many colleagues, female colleagues, I think the way women work is different, generally, um, in, in their approach. And may it's not just down to being more collaborative. I think that maybe the values that we have or we put on different aspects of this work are different. Um, and unfortunately, I think that is not always reflected in the way that we, we're experiencing promotions or seeing people being promoted. So I, I do get the sense of that, even though when you're working at the sort of highest level, still a little bit of an old boys network going on. I'll just call this person or I'll just call that person. We don't tend to do that. I mean, we do chat, but we don't tend to think, OK, I've just got another female friend I'll call to find this out. Um, so I think there are ways of working that I think are still really embedded. And my own frustration is I think a lot of the narrative that we're seeing coming out in the UK is still very male dominated. Um, there are women there, but I, we see, we just see men on TV all the time still. And I know the journalists are trying so hard to, to get more representation. But part of that, which we, I think we've all discussed, is that you know we don't like to go outside our expertise. I don't think it's right to go on television and give my personal opinion. Of course, I've got a personal opinion. I could talk about mutations I know nothing about. Um, what we do see is quite a lot of other people doing that. And I find that a little bit frustrating. And I don't think the solution is to copy it. That women don't need to become like men to succeed. We need the system to change and those barriers to come down. And that will only be through having more female leadership and a balance. Um, I think we've still got a long way to go. And I think the pandemic's put women back an awful lot more. I mean, we've got great women in science, but there's, there's, there's a long way to go now. I mean, I, I would, I mean, echo what you've both said. I would just like to say, but I think uh, what the pandemic has done more generally for women and 
for women in science who are at a different stage of their careers and lives than um, I won't say we're all at the same stages, but um, I think that people have had you know, the most difficult time with the people that I know and I've been working with who've got small kids and who have just had the most or are continuing to have a really, really challenging time and yet still trying to make their careers work and thinking to the future and yet, you know, you know, homeschooling, working from home, trying to balance. If you have got a partner as well, then, you know, doing shifts so that you can both actually try and do a full day while looking after the kids as well. I mean, it just it looks really, really hard. And I would just sort of put a shout out to those women who I think have really, really, you know, done an amazing job to uh, to keep going at all. I, you know, I kind of think, oh, my God, if I still had small children, I don't know what you know, I couldn't have done half of what I could have been able to do. And so and I think that that will have a lasting effect that people will. We have to really try to make sure that those um, women's careers are not adversely affected by what they've had to um, do over this. I mean, they're, they've been amazing, but it's I just I really feel for them. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. And um, I think that's just it's it's really so interesting to hear to hear your thoughts of that, because there are many times and um, when I've often thought, Wendy, myself, that oh, it's so much easier working with women, actually, um, because some things do come up and just go, oh, well, it just feels a very different interaction. And of course, uh, whether we sort of are aware of that or not, it does it does impact on on women's uh, career paths and choices and, and movement along them. So and at that point you've just highlighted there, Helen, in that we know for a fact that there's been um, a, a gender based fallout from the pandemic where women have been um, disadvantaged um, economically and in their careers and um, we need to sort of think about how we're going to get wonderful future scientists <laughs> um, if we post this pandemic if we're not acutely aware of that and actively we're working um, to promote them. Uh, I've got a few well there's one question that's been liked quite a lot and I, I know we'd had a chat before and we were we didn't want to talk too much about um, the the clinical presentations or long COVID. But is anybody doing research on long COVID um, or thoughts on what might be causing it? Does anyone know of groups? Well, we. <laughs> so the work that um, I have most and Wendy and I have been mostly um, well, not mostly, but we've been doing a lot of over the last year is the REACT study where that's the community surveillance. And um, as a an offshoot of that, we're doing REACT long COVID, where we're going to be following up people who we know to have had COVID either because we and they were PCR positive in one of our surveys or because they have antibodies. And um, some of those will be followed up in great detail doing, uh, you know, whole genome sequencing and things like that. Um, and um, others will be followed up by either record linkage if they've consented to that, or we will be sending and we'll be sending out surveys to people. And the, I, what we think is going to be useful about this is that we've got a, as I said, we've got two, you know, data on two million people, but we've got say 30, 40,000 people we know have had COVID, and most of those have been in the community and not been in hospital. So it's the whole spectrum of severity of. Um, infection and um, disease and we are able to look at those who've had confirmed infection, those who think they might have had infection and compare symptoms in the longer term because if you think one of the problems of defining something like long Covid, so we're all aware that there are some very um, severe symptoms that some people are getting for a prolonged period of time and there are some very, um, some of them are very um, specific, the loss of smell and taste, some of the things around uh, respiratory functioning, lung functioning, chest um, discomforts, and then there's other very general, the deep malaise, the tiredness, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. Now, to be able to understand that, you need first of all a lot of the biological mar possible markers and explanations for that, but you also need to look at how common those are in the population generally, as well as in those who've had COVID, because 
I think you said at the beginning, Red, you know, we don't know what would we don't know what would have happened if we hadn't done it. Well, we also we need to look at the fact that everybody's lives have changed in the last year. So the fact that you had COVID in March last year, um, as some people here did, then, you know, and maybe you're, you know, feeling that you're not sleeping well or whatever. But then there's people who didn't have it, who are also feeling different because they've been sitting in front of a desk for 12 months at home and not getting out. So there's many other things that have been going on and we have to look at all of those health, try and look as in as much detail at the health outcomes of people with and without COVID um, and get as much information together as we can. So our project's going to be working very closely with patients um, to get the patient, um, patients' ideas of what the key outcomes are that, that they think are important and we'll try and measure those and try and get some understanding of the biological pathways. So it's another collaboration that we will be um, exhausting ourselves over <laughs> the next three years. <laughs> Wendy, do you have anything to sort of add on that? Well, just to reiterate what Helen said, it's very easy to brand long COVID, but I think we will discover that there are many diseases that get triggered by the events of the last year. And, and the most important thing is going to be able to, to separate them out, because in order to understand any biology and therefore any possible treatments for those diseases, any logical treatments, uh, you need to understand the underlying biology, but if you lump them all together, it will end up being too complex and, and, and you won't be able to get to mechanistic pathways. So the, the most important thing here is to have some accurate descriptions of the symptoms and, and clinical signs and try and group them into what I might call be a spectrum of syndromes, uh, which will be the result of infection or change of life um, and, and that, that early part is just so important uh, to set straight before we go forwards and try and pick it all apart and work out how to treat it. We, we, we've got to define it, define the problem first, or problems. Yeah, it, I mean, it problems and the emphasis because it, it's really a constellation of, of so many different symptoms and presentations. Um, great, that's fantastic. So, um, We've got, if, oh, that's no, just the thank you. Anonymous says thank you. I appreciate you mentioning this as a single mother of young children working in clinical research. It's been very challenging. Um, it's very, very important that. Um, closing then, what do you think? So we've had a year of this pandemic and we've had a really in incredible developments, advances, impacts on, you know, your careers, your personal lives as well, everyone's careers and personal lives. What do you think is going to be really important in this year coming up? I mean, do you think the uh, findings from React and the work that you're doing there is going to be, um, is going to be a, the biggest part of the work you're doing this coming year and have the largest impact or what's, and in the global scale of the pandemic, if you can um, try and uh, project or estimate what we think is going to be happening in the next year. What what do you think you'd say a year from now? What will we be discussing? What we'll be thinking about? We'll be outside, we'll, we'll be in the pub, be enjoying the good weather. Goodness, that's a hard one to say. Big question. It's really big questions. Um, and I guess a lot of my focus, and I've been asked this a lot, is, you know, what is the global pandemic? What, what other directions are going? And, and I've also, most of my head got a sort of best case and a perhaps worst case. I mean, the best case really is, I mean, and I've heard, we've heard a lo lovely positive vibes from, from Wendy on this, that the vaccines continue to work, right? And, and this does become a big success story. Then I think at least within the UK and Europe or wherever, then our lives will return perhaps to much more of a normal level. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, the whole his history of this will be forgotten quite quickly. Um, and that if you look back 100 years in the flu pandemic, you saw the, the roaring 20s, whatever, it, you know, people are resilient as a, a species and, and will get, a, get over this and return. I think the biggest issue is going to remain the divide that will happen between high income and the lower middle income countries that these will continue to affect those countries for several years. The vaccines will not get out as quickly. The systems aren't in place necessarily. Even if the supply gets there to, to do this level of mass vaccination, it's a really daunting task to do for a whole population rapidly. 
Um, so I think we'll continue to see more of a divide. And just as we see perhaps more of a divide um, and more inequality in the UK as well, we may well see that happening globally. And um, worst case, of course, is if this all goes wrong. And <laughs> I don't think we want to go there on a Friday afternoon. Let's try and stay positive. Thank you. Uh, Helen, do you? Yeah, I mean, I think academically what I think, I mean, I think the focus, um, I'm hoping that the focus can be on working on this, the, the long COVID type work, i.e. looking forward to how we can improve people's health and well-being in the aftermath um, and to have the time to do that is sort of dependent on us getting a bit of a relief from the surveillance of, of the current and continued um, new infections. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get a bit of breathing space where we can start to look at these longer questions, but also to, I mean, we have got an enormous amount of data and, and Azra has this from other sources as well, that we haven't had the time to interrogate as much as we would like. Um, about what has what has made some people more vulnerable than others, what other factors, what what can we learn from we've got such detailed information on different household structures, different household sizes, different work, different uh, patterns of contact, overseas travel, all of those kind of things to understand how they've put people at risk or protected people. And I think we can do a lot more with those things to, to understand and reflect back and perhaps learn. Um, well, we may learn, but then perhaps be in a better position for future for challenges. And I don't know, I was asked by The Guardian to do a thing about, you know, a letter to my future self a few months ago. And it's a really difficult thing to do. What um, and it was about me now. What would I say now to myself? Um, or what would I say to myself now? And it's really it's really difficult to know. I mean, I am. Um, basically an, an optimist in terms of the science. I am unfortunately a pessimist when it comes to any serious addressing of the underlying inequalities, both in social inequalities within countries and the inequalities between countries. So that's where, you know, I would like us to make more advances. Yeah. Um, oops. That might not necessarily be with in our power as scientists and clinicians and um, but yeah that's that's a really fundamental one isn't it um wendy um what what do you think well, you? Very, yeah, very briefly i mean the bad news is that this virus isn't going to go away this virus is now part of human life you know for decades it, um but the good news is that the best case scenario if i paint it from a virological point of view is this virus doesn't really make younger people particularly sick, particularly if they get it the second or third time. So, so we, we have four seasonal coronaviruses that have circulated with humanity for at least 100 years, probably many of them longer, and they don't cause, as far as we know, any serious problem really um, in young healthy people. Interestingly, if you do infect older people, they sometimes can, and that's not so different than the current virus. What I mean to say is if we change our immunological settings, we may well learn to live with this virus pretty well and transform it, gradually chaperone it, if you like, from the pandemic virus it is into the more friendly common cold virus that we know and don't panic about in, in the same way. So my prediction of the future is that, that, that we, we will cope with this combination of vaccines and other measures when we need uh, and gradually children will grow up having experienced this virus and having some immun immunological memory to it such that it transforms into a virus which is much less hazardous for the human body. It's another really hopeful message which is great that's um, that's a, a wonderful possibility to consider definitely on a, on a Friday afternoon and I am hoping that I'll be able to go to the pub on a Friday afternoon in a year from now, Friday afternoon or evening. Um, it's a little later here. Um, so I think we're going to have to um, just draw this to a close and thank all three of you, Professor Azra Gianni, Professor 
um, Helen Ward and Professor Wendy Barclay for your contributions, which have been just wonderful. Um, it's great to have such, um, such a cutting edge take on the science and the work that you're doing in the context of this pandemic and just such thoughtful and inspiring observations on, on you know, the future for women who want to do the kind of work that, that you do. Um, so it really has been an excellent end to our Women at Imperial um, Week, which there will be more events of in the coming week, as Stephen has mentioned at the start. We actually haven't had too many questions that we've not answered. Um, if you do have specific questions that weren't answered, um, you're one of the one or two in the chat. I suggest you just um, at Helen, Azra or Wendy on Twitter <laughs> and maybe they'll get back to you with a brief answer of uh, a few characters. So that's it. I don't want to keep anyone any longer um, um, on this Friday afternoon. Just a very, very big thanks to, to our three panellists and a special thanks to Sheena, who's been, um, and Sam, who have been behind the scenes making all of this work for us. Um, so thank you, the EDI unit and the comms people at Imperial as well. Have a lovely afternoon um, and take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.